Welcome to Human Rights Education Now, a podcast series from Human Rights Educators USA. I'm your host, Bill Fernikes, a member of the National Steering Committee of HRE USA, a collaborative network to learn, teach, organize, advocate, and innovate for human rights education in the United States. This podcast aims to raise awareness about human rights education and invites listeners to engage with the worldwide movement to make human rights education a core focus of educational programs from preschool through higher education and in both non-formal and informal community educational settings. This episode concludes our conversation with four human rights education leaders from the state of Connecticut, Chris Buckley, Jake Skipik, Kevin Masonette, and Shireen Unvala. Chris is a social studies teacher at Brookfield Connecticut High School, while Jake teaches social studies at Manchester Connecticut High School. Kevin Masonette is a June 2023 graduate of Manchester High School and currently a freshman at Fordham University, while Shireen Unvala is a senior at Brian McMahon Global Studies High School in Norwalk, Connecticut. They discuss the importance of examining human rights issues at the local community level, how young people can be engaged as human rights activists, the expanding role of HRE in the National Council for the Social Studies, suggestions for improving the the integration of HRE in K-12 education nationwide, and their most significant role models for their work in human rights education. I want to go back to another issue, though, that uh, Jake and Chris have been involved in, and Can you talk a little bit about what you've done at the National Social Studies Council with the human rights education community? Uh, Sure. So um, Jake and I are are both members of of NCSS, the National Council for the Social Studies, um, you know, which is the the organization that that provides both uh, guidance, but also support for all social studies teachers across uh, across the country and really and really the world. Um, Because when we go there are there are, you know, Member groups from Canada and, and other parts of the world. So it, this is this is a really an international opportunity, um, and we we co-chair the Human Rights Education Community, which is a special interest group, uh, kind of within um, within NCSS that works to further further information, further uh, resources, and and make connections for educators who are interested in finding out uh, finding out more. Jake and I. Um, Kind of assumed the co-leadership or co-chair components about two years ago um, when we took over from um, from uh, Rosemary Blanchard, who uh, founded the um, human rights education community and, and has done amazing work in, in furthering human rights education as a prominent aspect of of um, of social studies education and wrote many of the documents around which we continue to further in our in our work. Um, and so every year when they have the annual co- uh, council or annual conference, Jake and I go and we we host the community. We have tables out where we bring together resources that are free, um, you know, for educators and and work to to help um, our colleagues kind of find the interconnectivity of of what they're seeing from the other amazing presentations that are there, and then how they can connect that to many of the principles um, we were just uh, we were just discussing. Uh, a, a lot of the work, and I'll let Jake speak to this too, but a lot of w- what we've been able to do building on the work that Rosemary and uh, Christy Redelius Palmer and many of the people who have come before us is as we now sit on the on the um, planning committee for the upcoming Nashville uh, convention, which is happening in December, and then also in Boston, which is happening the following year. And, and our big push has been to get human rights friendly language, but also human rights direct language into the descriptors of what the organization is about. So, um, you know, now we have a community, now people are aware education, human rights education is something they can consider, but we want it to be present when people think to present, when they go on um, the website, that it's something where the words human right education or human rights are not coded, as you were kind of referencing, through civil rights or coded through um, social emotional learning, but is a, is a prominent piece of language that, um, that you know, people can can connect to and understand that is is significant. Um, and so that's been a big part of the work that we've done with with NCSS and the human rights education community um, is, is to push for language that allows for our colleagues who work in parts of the country in which, as you referenced earlier, um, 
maybe aren't as friendly to the teaching of, of human rights education as a flat concept um, and, and providing resources that helps them work with administrators who maybe just need to have this reframed for them or um, community members who don't quite understand the significance of it. A lot of the work that we do is providing support for our colleagues around the country who aren't as fortunate perhaps to have um, friendly organizations like or friendly school boards and communities like we have. The only other thing I would add, I think Chris really said it well, is um, I think our our roles and what's exciting about it is that we're continually seeing um, and trying to build new opportunities within the organization. So um, whether it's having conversations on a, a planning committee or talking with other stakeholders as part of NCSS, partnering with other uh, special interest communities, um, I think our kind of philosophy is, you know, what's the next step? What, where can we go from here? Um, and not not necessarily just being okay with, um, okay, well, this is good where we are. We want to see where where we want to, uh, how can we advance this community and, and continue to uh, advance social studies uh, altogether? And I, and if I could just add, I think, you know, given the audience and, and, and the hosting organization for this, that it's worth noting that like right on the homepage, um, there's a position statement on human rights education that Jake and I and uh, Dr. Glenn Matoma were, were a big part of writing. So for those who are listening, who are looking for a concise statement around which pieces can be pulled to justify why the teaching of human rights education, uh, it's, it's right there on the homepage. And I think that is one thing that NCSS has done particularly well is, is made prominent position statements around controversial, uh, but important. I, I don't want to use the word controversial, maybe because it makes it sound as if it, it doesn't have a place, if something has controversy, this has a place. Um, so those resources are available and readily available for educators who are looking. I think often we just don't know where to look uh, until the NCSS provides that in, I think, a very nice way. What, one additional thing I would add is that I think a statement like the position statement we're referencing actually could be applicable to other disciplines mm, as well. I think so, yeah. It's written in a way, but also I think it's just good verbiage for an English teacher or for a science teacher or for an elementary school teacher to, again, bring back to their community and say, OK, yeah, this might not be directly related to my discipline, but here's the importance of HRE within public education or, or K-12 education. Well, one suggestion I would offer is that NCSS has just begun doing electronic publications that are free. And it seems timely that uh, with the project you're doing in Connecticut and working with other people and students like Kevin and Shireen, that you could actually develop a nice electronic publication about integrating human rights education in the schools. And I think it's timely for that. So uh, that's my suggestion. You can get right on it now. Well, anyway, let's move. Go ahead, well, Chris. Well, I just wanted to add, though, that I think that often one of the barriers to, to this for districts and parts of the country, maybe where this isn't happening a lot, is that teachers feel like they're on an island by themselves and that there isn't any, they don't know where to go or they don't think that there's anybody else doing this doing this work. And so I think um, one of the exciting parts of being on this podcast and 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 just kind of to, I don't want to speak for Jake, but I, I will, uh, is that like we're, 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 we're right, we're available or, or, you know, please email and ask. I mean, that's how I think we were both connected to this is somebody just reached out and we reached out and somebody helped us. And so the nice thing about NCSS is that it is a, is a culmination of national teachers who can, who can get help. So, you know, those resources are available and, and Jake and I are certainly, I think, able to, and willing, very willing to get on a call and help and, and share our insights um, regardless of region. Okay. Well, I want to move on to uh, our last two topics. And the first one deals with the fact that right now in this country, there are some pretty serious emerging threats to fundamental human rights. So I'll just note a few of them. Uh, academic freedom challenges, uh, censorship of publications, voting rights restrictions, uh, violence direction against minorities, and not a lot of forward movement on issues dealing with refugees, for example, and migrants. So and I'm going to start with uh, the students. How would you think about using human rights education to address one of those challenges? You pick the challenge, but how would you might say, I'm going to try to deploy human rights education to try to address one? Um, with one of the ways I have been focusing on getting like human rights to seem very concrete 
to um students around like our state around this initiative and around like this country by making it seem you know very concrete very like influential and um like the i think the first key step to getting that like the sort of um action for human rights to actually make a difference is by making people understand that this is like an altruistic thing and making them feel like the joy that like people who are doing really very good things can feel so um some of the things that i've really liked doing throughout my like time in human rights are things surrounding um like going to like speakers and like talking with them directly or with like i've gone to schools that have done fundraisers for like free trade chocolate and like all these things that are very like centered and like very honed in on like actually making a difference and all that stuff has stood out to me far more and like that's the sort of thing i really feel is important to resolving greater issues through human rights education okay Shereen? I think that a big um, important piece to this is kind of what Kevin was alluding to, which was kind of like mobilizing a group of people to kind of stand up next to you and say, like, this is something we want to fight for and we're willing to and kind of, you know, having people be energized about it and passionate. Um, and I think, you know, there's so many, so many ways that you can find that um and especially in terms of thinking about it in, in terms of kind of like what Mr. Buckley was saying, um, you might feel that, oh, am I the only one that kind of cares about this? You're struggling to find like a community of people. Um, and so I've, I've seen that in a lot of, you know, foundations or charities. Um, one, for example, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, which I am um, kind of involved in this year. Um, and, you know, there are so many people who are willing to we have this event coming up spin for colitis where you're doing spinning and you can, you know, set up a team of people and it's all in name of the, of the disease and, and research that goes into a potential cure. Um, and so kind of starting on the grassroots level and, you know, finding that people right next door are really willing to help and willing to get involved is, is a great starting place. So I, I would say, I, I do think that, um, addressing any of these issues does come from a local level. Um, the, if we're, if we're, so I would, I would say that as my, as my first response, I do think grassroots efforts, um, with local, uh, citizens is the, the first step. If we're thinking about addressing some of these issues from a federal level, um, two things that come to mind are just the, the, the recent, um, book banning, um, uh, you know, of queer, queer literature, uh, of queer identity, um, and of um, teaching black and brown histories, right? We're, we're constantly seeing these stories pop up of forms of censorship um, and discrimination and, and bigotry that, that's out there. Um, I really deeply believe that um, entities like the uh, U.S. Department of Education need to come out much stronger um, in terms of saying to um, boards of education saying to uh, local state governments, here are the steps in order to combat this weaponization of censorship and this attack against uh, basic identity. Um, I would love to see our federal governments stand up a little bit stronger and come out with toolkits, come out with roadmaps, come out with actionable items um, that specifically um, those citizens that I talked about before uh, and local representatives, local stakeholders can actually um, do in order to combat that. I, I would say, again, I think it does come back to local citizens standing up, going to your board of ed and saying, hey, we do not believe this is an acceptable uh, action that you're taking. But I, I do think um, there are entities and agencies that can um, do more out there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think for me the most the most concerning. Not, I mean, they're all they're all concerning. But to, to Jake's point about the censorship of education and and really the harm that's being done to kids when when we're 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 denying them their right as as individuals in any society to make decisions for themselves. I mean, government in some states is coming in and telling them how they need to consider information um, that first off is misleading and inaccurate, but then also is is quite insulting that kids that particularly our high school students can't make these decisions for themselves. Um, 
and to make sta statements, you know, it, th that we need to teach things like slavery was actually beneficial to people who were ripped from their homes. And, and you know, these things are, are, are problematic. I think when we talk about human rights education, there's there's two aspects of it. You know, one of the things that I, I talk with my students about is about the power of a name and the significance of, of taking a stand with your name as opposed to anonymity and teaching our students that, you know, like, you know, look, your, your elected officials need to hear from you. And, and um, I think to the comment you made earlier, the Tip O'Neill reference about Lowell, I mean, um, I, I think one of the important parts of human rights education, and we talk about kids, is the empowerment of young people to recognize that they can make a difference. And I think the fact that Kevin and Sharin are on this call is the embodiment of what human rights education done. I mean, these are hands down two of the most impressive young people I've ever worked with, and they're doing amazing things. And they're while they are incredibly unique, they are they are not particularly different than any of their classmates who could do this work if they were pushed with human rights education to do so. And so writing to their congressmen and their local officials, um, I think, is, is a huge component of this. Um, I think the other aspect is from human rights education is the recognition that people can change and need to be able to change it. I mean, if we don't acknowledge that while I might be different from you, if I sit in a room and have a conversation, I can convince you perhaps to to come over to my side. Um, is a huge important part of this. If we write people off and essentially say, you've made your mind up and I can't ever change it, then we will never cross that divide and fix some of the problems that exist here. And I think that's a big part of what human rights education teaches when it comes to dialogue and facilitation, which these two are fantastic at. Uh, and having young people recognize that I, I know how to sit in a room with somebody who I fundamentally disagree with and can talk with them without calling them names, without becoming insulting, and we can actually make make progress, uh, I think is a is a huge component of what what we need to do on, on a local level. I think if we look at these things as being massively large, we have issues with refugee rights and issue with immigration rights, then they become things that young people think they can't change. But if we talk about it on a local level, what can you do to your local first select woman or first select gentleman or, you know, who can you write to and, and empower your voice? Those little victories will teach them that there are larger victories which are in reach and I think that that's a big part of what human rights education can particularly do um, in, in a way that is 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 relatively safe for for young people before they start taking, you know, potentially larger risks and and and, you know, uh, making a bigger splash. Well, it's interesting that you're talking about sort of a progression from. Learning to action from learning in the classroom to taking the next step. And on one of our prior episodes, uh, I asked a question about what should be a step the government should take. And one person responded, well, I think we should educate the staff members and members of Congress, because those are the people who really write the legislation. Those are the people who advise the people who are elected. And that would be an interesting trajectory to see how many of your graduates will end up being assistants and or uh, staff members in Congress at some date. You, you never know. Well, I so think me, I know it's ahead, something. Chris. Sorry, I know it's something Kevin desperately wants to do. Uh, but I also think it's not just the congressman. I mean, I have a number of former students who work as aides, and it's those aides who do the research. It's those aides who actually very much write a lot of this legislation that their bosses then go and speak on the floor of Congress about. So it's it's not just getting access to the fifty. Or I'm sorry, the hundred senators. You know, it's getting access to to those people who are doing the research for them and getting those people to make you know to look in the right places uh, for the research. And um, that's why. We're hopeful Kevin and Sharon will do amazing things in government. Well, as we turn to our last few questions, uh, these are the same three questions I ask at the end of every episode. So I'm going to start with uh, the first one, and we're going to go around the horn. So we'll start with you, Chris. Who would be the most influential role model for your work in human rights education? Someone who's alive today who, is, who has passed on? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, she she knows this. Uh, she's she's uh, for me. It's it's uh, Karen Robinson who works for RFK Human Rights. Um, she's a fantastic human being, and she is quite literally the reason I do this work. Um, she's the person who asked me um, probably 15 years ago if I would just if I would go to this human rights thing. Uh, no one ever asked me to do it before, and she did. And and um, you know she just. She is a wonderfully grounded person who's done amazing things. And um, 
really knows so much about how to make change and is pushing all all the right people to do all the right things. Um, and so she works for RFK Human Rights and has worked for Amnesty in the past. And um, I think when we talk about education through and for, uh, that's one of the reasons why for me, she's such a role model because the way in which she lives her life, uh, her, her, her family dynamic, her children, her husband, her work relationships, they all are emblematic of the qualities of a human rights activist. And I think that's a very big ask. I, I, I know very few people who, who do that, including myself, uh, you know, and, and I think she is both emblematic of the work she does, but also the way she lives her life. So uh, for me, it would be uh, Karen Robinson. Okay, Jake, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a lot of people I I could name. Um, I'm I'm similar to to Chris. I do think that um, Glematoma has been a a huge huge influence, and I, I say that because um, I think he's a unique person who has reached out and given people opportunities, um, has partnered with them, and said. Um, I believe in the work that you could do. Um, and I think that very central principle of seeing potential in people, seeing that there is worth um, in every person's um, work that they give and their effort and their their contributions um, is something that I think has been a hallmark of my life, has centered my relationships, has centered um, my work with other adults, my work with, with uh, young people. And so um, I really look to Glenn as kind of that model of possibility and and partnership. Rin? Um, I would say other than Mr. Buckley and Mr. Skripik, who they're really honestly very inspirational to me because this is not something that comes with their regular like nine to five, so to speak. This is something that they actively are choosing to do every day when they wake up um, and kind of, you know, not just like be sort of another teacher to Kevin and I, but to be an advisor, to be a mentor, to be willing to work and grow with us is just so like, I don't know, I just appreciate it so much. Um, but other other than you guys, which you guys are great, I would have to say Malala is just a huge um, human rights uh, role model for me. I mean, just everything she's done um, and her her grit and her um her courage to stand against you know unbelievable odds um in Pakistan all in the name of you know furthering education for for children is just something that is truly um eye opening and i know you know she's just a huge public figure so i guess she would be my you know global human rights role model and then mr buckley and mr skripik would be my close to home uh human rights models Go ahead, Kevin. Yes, I was about to say this as well. Mr. Buckley and Mr. Skripik are by far and large, like the perhaps the greatest like role models in like my own personal life. Like they've really encouraged me and they've really helped me to go even to Fordham. Like there is there's no way like without them inviting me to this initiative that I would have the opportunities that I do now. And they've continued to encourage me throughout the entire initiative. Whenever I found um, difficulty, with um, like presenting things. When I was at the youth summit and occasionally I was very frustrated with my efforts. I remember very distinctly these two coming up to me and helping me like sort my emotions out and really like focusing on how to drive this home. They, they just are very, they're very true role models to me. Um, on, in a different way, like throughout history, there are lots of people who I really admire who have done amazing things, um, but they aren't necessarily involved in the realm of human rights. They just really want to do something good. They're altruists. And like, honestly, I feel like that's what human rights is. Just like doing things for your fellow man. Not necessarily, it doesn't even have to be fully related to the field, to the academic field. It's a broad thing. Um, but personally, my one role model I'd say would be um, Raphael Lemkin, who isn't really well known, I'd say. Um, he's not too talked about. But I took a class again with Mr. Skripik, and um, we watched a film that um, featured him and his story. I believe it was um, Watchers of the Sky, and I just found him so cool. Um, he lived in Poland and in like the early days of World War II, and he fled to um, the U.S. before the Holocaust, and he made some really revolutionary changes to human rights. He coined the term genocide, and he exhausted himself in his efforts to get the world to ratify the Genocide Convention, and he's just not known enough today at all. 
like his like selfless um, altruism is just a great role model to me. Okay, so uh, now we're going to turn to the quote. So which quote most effectively sums up your view of the importance of human rights? Uh, anybody can start. I'll start. Um, I really uh, appreciate um, and admire uh, Greta Thunberg's work. I think she's been a fantastic advocate and and she has this quote that, that has stuck with me. Uh, I'm telling you there is hope. I have seen it, but it does not come from governments or corporations. It comes from the people. Um, and so that really sticks with me as, again, going back to local citizens from a grassroots level, um, people power is incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, I can I can go next. Um, you know, for me, uh, my entry into human rights work really came through the work of RFK and RFK Human Rights. And so, um, you know, he, his his work, I think, is emblematic of so much of what it means to be an activist. Um, and he's well known for his uh, for a speech he gave um, uh, in South Africa. Uh, and there's there's two aspects of the speech. And one, I think, is really relatively well known and the other perhaps not. But the the primary part that really stands out to me is is each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million tiny centers of uh, different centers of energy and daring these ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Um, shortly before that, though, he speaks about the importance of youth. And, and that part, I think, is very important where it, he says the our answer is the world's hope and it is to rely on youth. And I think, you know, that when we think about human rights education and all of this it, is young people and our our continued hope in what they can do. OK, Kevin. Um, a while ago, I was wondering where the name of human rights close to home, like where exactly that came from. And there it comes from a quote by um, Eleanor Roosevelt, I believe, um, who is known pretty commonly for being the first lady of um, FDR. But she has also played a very huge role in the formation of the UDHR. So I might have the quote exactly. She said, um, where, after all, do universal human rights begin in small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world? Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. And I really love that quote. I agree. Shireen? So this quote is actually also um, one of my dad's favorite quotes. And it's very, um, I think, close to the heart because actually my grandfather um, dropped out of his studies one semester short of obtaining his PhD for physics to join the Quit India movement. And so this kind of always, this is kind of a reminder of that spirit, I would say. So um, it's by uh, Martin Luther King. We shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So I think, um, and this is very, you know, echoing what everyone else has really said is, you know, human rights can be heavy at times and often discouraging depending on which side you know the pendulum swings but it's it's always great to remember that there is a light of hope and the good will outweigh the bad um and there is that you know glimmer of glimmer of hope that keeps people going um and it has kept people going since you know Martin Luther King and well before him so yeah that that's my that's my little quote and before we get to our last question, I'll add one that uh, has always inspired me, and that is by Paul Robeson. The answer to injustice is not to silence the critic, but to end the injustice. So let's turn to our last question, which is, if you had the power to make one critical change to advance human rights education in the United States, what would you do? And that's just one. I'm sure you have five or six, but give us the top one. Start with you, Jake. I think a, a critical change is um, bringing more people together across ideologies, across boundaries, across states, uh, you name it. Um, I think we need more spaces of dialogue and we need more spaces where people are conversing and, um, you know, maybe 
productively disagreeing with one another. I, I really deeply believe that um, there are times where that is not appropriate. Um, and I think there are boundaries that can be set up. But I do think in order to advance human rights ed, in order to advance um, true justice, we really deeply need um, more people talking face to face with one another um, in order to not only address the issues that we're facing, but also uh, see the possibility of um, how humanity can be more dignified and more um, leaning towards justice. Chris, you're next. Yeah, I mean, I I couldn't agree more with Jake. I, I think um, if I could, if I could make one change, if I had the power to do that, I think it would be to mandate that it's a graduation requirement for all for all students uh, in this country. You know, if the if we could mandate that a course exists that you know, not only taught the about stuff, right, got kids to engage with this stuff, but taught the skill sets that come through. And for, uh, I think we would have a much more progressive society where people, you know, understand not only how, you know, the importance of behaving like a good person, but also, you know, how to how to affect change and, and bring good things in. So for me, it would be to, to mandate it as a graduation requirement right up there with math, science, and, uh, and reading and social studies. Okay, Kevin. I was going to say something on a very, very similar note. I really feel that making human rights mandatory in more high schools is a great key. Um, like, it's really made a very huge difference in like my life, like taking this mandatory course. Like, and I understand that quite a few students myself, like that from what I've experienced in Manchester High School, have found a similar opportunity and have grown interested in our initiative through it. And like, there's a lot of opportunity that comes about through it. And I understand that there are some nuances to it, that some communities might not be necessarily willing to mandate something related to human rights as strict as it might sound. But I really feel that something related to like the civics of it, the altruism of it would be really important elsewhere. So I strongly support mandating it elsewhere. Okay, Sharon, you've got the last word. I would again have to agree with um, mandating human rights um, as a high school graduation requirement. Um, but I think to add to that, I think, you know, we're, we're we're viewing it as, you know, education in school, but I feel like human rights is a lifelong education, if you will. I think that if we could start from a really young age, and, you know, this was already kind of mentioned, um, but, you know, have it be something that sticks with you, not only through your years of, of schooling, but beyond that, um, and have it be something that maybe isn't taught as, you know, a regular uh, mathematics or um, science subject, but have it be taught in a way that is, you know, more more focused on on the storytelling part and more on the, you know, how how can I tug at your heartstrings and how can I connect with you on a on a personal level? Um, I think that'll make all the difference. So. Well, I think whoever listens to this podcast will be inspired by what you've said. And I mean all four of you. So it's been a pleasure to speak with you today. And I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Human Rights Education Now. You can find additional information about this podcast series at www.hreusa.org. Each episode is available on the HRE USA podcast page, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Player FM, and Deezer. They soon will be available on YouTube and SoundCloud. You can also download each episode as an MP3 file. If you have questions or comments about this podcast, send them to christy at hreusa.org. That's K-R-I-S-T-I at hreusa.org. Our podcast team includes host and producer Bill Fernigues, executive producer Christy Redalius palmer editor Elizabeth Schwab, sound designer and project manager Sabrina Sanchez, communications and public outreach coordinator Jessica Terbrugan, and production coordinator Jasmine Chizu Gota. The Human Rights Education Now logo was designed by Kim Berry. Human Rights Education Now is a production of Human Rights Educators USA, a project of the Center for Transformative Action in Ithaca, New York.